Right, okay, um, in this video, I've set myself quite a big task. Um, this is designed to be for A to economic students that want a quick refresher on what AS Macroeconomics was all about. Okay, so what we'll try to do is to think about, first of all, the macro targets. Because ultimately, this is what it always comes back to with macroeconomics, achieving targets for the economy. We have economic growth, we have low unemployment, we have an inflation target of 2%, we have targets such as attempts to reduce the trade deficit. More recently, it's about trying to lower government debt. But then we have wider ones, such as, depending on your political beliefs, lower inequality. And we have environmental targets too. Now, if we were just to go through these in order, let's think about economic growth first of all. Um, economic growth, we know, is measured by an increase in GDP basically measuring the output of the economy. Now the idea will be that the higher the GDP rate, then the higher the average wage, so the higher the GDP per capita, and the lower the rate of unemployment will be as well. Um, we measure unemployment normally through the ILO, or the claimant count. It's basically looking at, well, which way you look at it, we can measure it through the unemployment rate, which looks at the proportion of the labour force who are unemployed. So Britain at the moment, as I'm talking to you right now, is at 4.9%. Um, we also look at the unemployment level, which is the number of people unemployed. Okay. Inflation, there are two approaches. You have the consumer price index and the retail price index. As, as we remember, inflation, all it really is, it's a growth in price levels over a period of time. Um, we set a 2% target because this is the rate that we deem to promote confidence across the economy. We all want to see our wages grow, the value of our properties increase. This is the level that we think promotes confidence. Anything higher, and it's deemed to be too high, it could lead to lower international competitiveness. It could lead to higher costs for people, so they can't afford to buy things, for example. Um, we don't set it any lower than 2% because this is deemed to be dangerous flirting with the danger of deflation, price levels fall, if they were to fall over time, it could lead to lower confidence, people buying less across the economy. Um, trade deficit. Okay, now we measure this through the current account, which basically measures the gap between money coming into the economy from abroad, measured against the money that leaves our economy to go abroad. So we're really looking here at imports and exports. Britain at the moment, the value of our imports exceed the value of our exports, which means overall we have a trade deficit. Okay, um, if you bring this down, it means that more is being produced in Britain, we're less reliant on foreign goods and services. Um, a key one recently has been trying to tackle budget deficit. Okay, so when it comes to fiscal policy for years, Britain as an economy, our government has been spending way more on us guys than what they've been getting back through taxes. So, currently we're trying to reduce our budget deficit. Now, to get overall state debt down, what we need to do is to run a budget surplus, which will mean that the level of taxation money coming into the government exceeds the amount of money going back out again. Inequality, it's not one we've really focused on much in AS Economics. It's basically looking at trying to lower the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, we also have environmental targets. So trying to reduce CO2 emissions, for example, promote recyclable waste. And we looked at a lot of this stuff in microeconomics, looking at promoting um, renewable energy, so positive externalities, for example. Now, if we move on beyond this, what we then looked at in macroeconomics was how we can build up models. Uh, we had the circular flow of income, output and expenditure. So let's think about this households and firms. Think about this relationship between these two sets of people, these two agents across the economy. Now, think about what um, 
them require from households. They require from us the factors of production, mainly labour, but we also buy shares in businesses. We also own land that businesses might rent off us. So what we get back in exchange are wages for our labour, rent on land that we might own, and dividends, which is our share of their profits, if you like. Okay, now what we then assume, though, is that households will use this money to buy goods and services. So we use that money to spend back on firms. In exchange for that spending, we receive goods and services. And basically, the size of this diagram represents the amount of output in the economy. It's basically the GDP. Okay, so when you want this thing to get bigger, you've got to promote a growth in the injections. And they are investment, government spending, and exports. If inflation's too high, what you might decide to do is to leak some money out. It's like a balloon. You're literally either blowing air in to make it get bigger, or taking air out to make it smaller. These are savings, taxes, and imports. Now, if we take this a little bit further, we can then see how economies change over time. So let's bring in the business cycle. What we have, we have our trend rate of growth. And that's basically looking at potential economic growth. It measures how much the LRAS, or that production possibility frontier, moves out over time. Um, the actual cycle, measures how actual GDP changes over time. And really, for now, all we need to think about is we have peaks, where we're running a positive output gap, we have troughs, and we have negative output gaps. Now, at a peak, it looks good, GDP is really, really high, but there's that danger that this positive output gap means we've got massive scarcity across the economy. So we've got really, really high inflation because of the scarcity. In a trough, it's, it's the complete opposite problem. We've got a big negative output gap, which means lots of resources are not being used. So here, what we have, we have the problem of, well, possibly deflation, but we have high unemployment. Okay, so, particularly a Keynesian economist, what they would say is that when you're in a trough, you've got to boost demand. In other words, make that circular flow of income get bigger promote the injections, help the economy grow. When you're in a peak, well, you know, this time to get rid of the high inflation, you deflate the economy to get back down to the trend rate. And the job for economists, really, at macroeconomic level anyway, is to try and operate as close as possible on this trend rate. Okay? Now, we can also view this on the Phillips curve. And all the Phillips curve does measures unemployment rates or the percentage against the inflation percentage and what we have we have the Phillips curve. Okay, so at point A for example, we have really, really high unemployment, but inflation's low. We could even have the danger of deflation. As we raise demand to move away from a trough so A is a trough basically then unemployment will fall, but we'll start to see inflation accelerating. At point B, we're at a peak. And here the problem is we've got super high inflation because unemployment is deemed to be too low. Many people are in a positive output gap. So with a lower demand, deflate the economy to get back somewhere in the middle. Okay, now to achieve these things, we can use fiscal policy. And monetary policy, and what these are basically are demand side policies. Different ways to change demand across the economy. So when you're at B and you want to bring the economy down, what you're basically looking to do is to raise taxes up to get people spending less, 
lowering government spending then through monetary policy you will be whacking up interest rates when you're at a you do the exact opposite you've got to inflate demand make that circuit to flow get bigger you lower taxes you raise government spending and you bring down interest rates okay now what we also have let's go back a page we have supply side policies and these are all about over time making the LRES curve move outwards which is the same as making production from spilter points here move outwards and supply side policies are all about either making resources better or increasing resources okay so the government could use fiscal policy so promote more spending on education to raise skills of labour, more grant subsidies to firms to enable them to invest more into capital, could be upgrading transport infrastructure, okay, um, lower interest rates through monetary policy can be used to make firms invest more, borrowings cheaper for example. So what we've got here then, if we go back to the beginning, we've got the macro targets, how we achieve all these different things across the economy, We've got the circular flow. We've got the economic cycle or the business cycle. We've got the Phillips curve. And the last thing I really want to bring in at this point, diagrams. So price level against real GDP. I'm just going to assume it's a classical world. So the idea is the LRES curve is the vertical line. It's the brick wall of the potential of the economy. Aggregate demand is made up of C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So consumers consume whether households, if you like, firms invest, the government spends, exports, because we're buying our stuff, and we take away the imports. And the idea is the lower the price level, the higher the demand will be. If I bring in the short run aggregate supply, simple way of thinking about this is it's a supply, it's a supply curve of what firms can produce in the UK economy. Now in the short run what we assume is that some factors of production are fixed. Normally it's the physical size of their capital, the machines they've got, the factories for example. These things can't be changed, not in the short run anyway, in the long run they can be, but in the short run these things are fixed, they've got to work with what they've got. But the idea is that if the price level increased, firms would want to produce more. So we end up with P1 YFO. Okay. So remember, movements along the curves are a simple change in price. If aggregate demand shifts, let's say to AD2, and this would be for reasons other than price level change. This could be higher confidence, promoting a growth in consumption. It could be the government changing policy and increasing government spending. It could be that the pound has become weaker, which means exports increase. It could simply be that we're putting bigger tariffs on imports, forcing more people in Britain to buy British goods and services. If aggregate demand falls, let's say to AD3, it's for the opposite reasons. Okay, it could be that income levels are falling, which means that people can't afford to buy as much stuff. Consumption falls, people are saving more money, for example. Maybe firms are pessimistic, they're investing less. Now, if we were to move to AD2, we've got a positive output gap. Okay, we're working beyond potential. If we were on AD3, we've got a negative output gap. So the ideal situation would be to be at P1 YFO. Right, okay, now let's think about SRAS. SRAS, and which is what firms are willing and able to supply at the moment simple way of thinking about this SRES will move out to the right if business costs fall and if business costs fall it will lead to a growth in supply price levels get squeezed down and people demand less uh, demand more even sorry if business costs increased SRES would shift to the left okay higher costs would lead to firms um, less willing able to produce 
bidding up price that's what we call in economics cost push inflation i mean the economy will get smaller okay now the very very final thing i want to show this is looking at demand and supply in the short run supply in the short in the long run trend rate growth all we would do imagine the short run but p1 y1 if we were to increase or improve the factors of production lras will move outwards and we grow and this is exactly the same thing as showing the production possibility boundary shifting outwards okay so that is your overall recap if you like for macroeconomics